Good afternoon. Welcome to LASER, Leonardo Art and Science Evenings Rendezvous, Talks, St. Petersburg. Today's discussion concerns art data, collecting, preserving, and displaying digital. Leonardo Lasers are a program of international gathering to bring artists, scientists, and technologists together for informal presentations. The mission of LASER is to encourage contribution to the cultural environment of the region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunity for community building. Digital, computer, and internet software and multimedia art form have been created for many years and now entered the mainstream art world. The milestone exhibitions, such as Whitney Biennial, included digital works as early as 2000, and Whitney Museum Art Board was launched in 2001. University Art Department around the world are formalizing digital media. Textbooks on digital art have been published. Conferences around art and technology are thriving. And gradually, museums and private collectors are beginning to accession works into digital media, their collections. The prominent curators, multimedia artists, researchers, data scientists, and collectors, Christian Paul, Lev Manovich, and Spelter and Anna Franz will address the issues of archiving and preserving, collecting and curating this dynamic, hybrid, sometimes fragile, vulnerable works or technique that rely on digital technology in creative or display processes. Many archival and preservation strategies include one or more of three main approaches to preserve digital information, the static preservation, migration, and emulation. However, even in combination, it is difficult to balance between the data and the appearance because it may cause unacceptable loss. What uh, the question will be, rise, uh, will be asking today, what are general guidelines for museums in terms of technical documentation and the displaying of digital art? What do museums and collectors need to be technically prepared to preserve and redisplay artworks? Does the artwork require any special software or hardware needs? If the work is interactive, how do people interact with work? Providing context is one of the important mission for all museums. What are the steps to document that environment to allow the future viewers to better understand the artwork itself? What are new formats for exhibitions of this extremely hybrid digital form? There are many unanswered questions for a long-term solution for preserving and redisplaying digital art, which requires research by artists, museum professional, and scientists. As digital media and technique develop, they create and explore the new viewer experiences. Artificial, artificial life and intelligence challenging and changing the creative process and our way of constructing meanings. Our first speaker, Christian Paul, is a chief curator and director of the Sheila Johnson Design Center and professor of School in Media Art in New York. She's a curator of digital art at the Whitney Museum, where she's responsible for Artport, the museum portal to internet art. She, uh, she, uh, create, uh, she curated many exhibitions, including programs, programmed rule, codes, and choreographies, and profiling. She is author of many books, including a campaigning to digital art, digital art context providers. Her book, Digital Art, the third edition, have been translated into Russian language and published by Garage. What made you decide to tackle these subjects? Tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself, your research and curatorial interest. Christian, please. 
thank you so much for the great introduction, Natalia, and thanks so much for having me. It's um, a great honor to be here. What I will do in a very brief presentation is just throw out some thoughts on collecting, preserving, and displaying the digital, which we can use as a basis for our discussion. So as you mentioned, I'm a curator at the Whitney Museum. And one of the forms in which we display digital art is online, which um, is the kind of presentation that has received a lot of attention during the time of COVID because it's the only way you could see art. So as you um, said, I have been curating the Artport website for the Whitney Museum for now 19 years. Uh, just to give you one example of um, a work that is currently on view, that's New York Apartment by Sam Levine and Tiga Brain. And what the artists did is basically scrape one of the prominent real estate websites and aggregate everything into this gigantic apartment that costs hundreds of millions and has 65,000 bedrooms, etc., along with virtual plans. And what this really does is present you with a portrait of the New York real estate market and the different layers to it. And I think this piece really resonated at this point in time. Another exhibition series for Artport is Sunrise and Sunset, where every morning and every evening at sunrise sunset time in New York, the Whitney.org website is taken over by a 30 second intervention of an artwork. And the work that is currently on view, American artists looted, uh, also really alludes to what has been going on recently. So if you visit Artport at sunrise uh, or sunset, you may see the site, but then everything will be boarded up and replaced by wooden boards that American um, has created alluding both to the fact that um, museums and art institutions have been boarded up recently and the fact uh, that many cultural institutions um, are housing looted artworks. So Artport, just as one example of how we present art online, and I'm going to throw out um, just a few slides of the program exhibition that you mentioned, programmed rules, codes, and choreographies in art 1965 to 2018, ran in 2018 and 19 at the Whitney Museum. I could talk an hour about displaying um, digital art, but I just want to draw your attention here to ways that the artworks really mutate. What you're looking at here is a large scale projection of two of Casey Rea's software structures projected next to a solid wood. And those works were originally commissioned for the Artport website. So you can see them in a very different form online. So a great transformation. And then here we're looking in the other direction into a section that deals more with the programming of uh, moving images. And one of the centerpieces was Namjoon Pike's Founder Siegle. We're talking about preservation. So this work over the course of five years was really reconstructed um, in an amazing preservation effort. So you get some looks behind the scenes here. And another uh, work that I want to draw your attention to that was part of program was Tamiko Thiel's um, Unexpected Growth and Augmented Reality work. And Augmented Reality also has received a lot of attention now during the time of COVID. This is a piece that you would encounter on the Whitney terraces, and it basically imagines the terraces already underwater you know, um, in times of climate change and presenting this beautiful coral reef that is ultimately made up of pollutants. So the work is both a warning and beautiful. And we had another AR work in the lobby of the Whitney Museum uh, in conjunction with Alan Michelson's uh, exhibition. And this one points to the fact that when the Lenape people, the indigenous communities originally inhabiting the site were living there. All of this and the site of the Whitney was a tobacco field. 
Very briefly, I also want to mention that AR has, uh, during the times of COVID, seen an emerging, uh, really, a resurgence in New York. So you're looking at Vince Frazier's We Rise Above that was organized by Our Tech House. And Digital Art Month also had numerous installations um, of AR. And to switch to a different um, topic, you mentioned AI. I cannot talk about this exhibition in depth. This was the question of intelligence, which I curated for the Sheila Johnson Design Center earlier in the year and which was cut short uh, due to COVID. But uh, obviously these are large scale uh, installations with a lot of complexity behind them. And I just want to draw your attention to a couple of pieces, uh, Tiger Brain's Deep Swamp, which consists of three AIs that are controlling natural environments, uh, all with different programmatic desires. And as you can imagine, it takes a lot to put this um, type of work into an exhibition space. And equally demanding was Bitsoil Pop-Up Text and Hack campaign by the Larbit Sisters, a project that uses an army of IBM's AI Watson natural language trained bots to basically create an alternative, fairer digital economy where you can sign up for accounts on Twitter and send out this army uh, of bots to collect taxes on your behalf. This just to give a um, very brief um, overview of the challenges. And I once again want to point out to a few models that in prominence in the times of COVID and that is translating physical exhibitions into virtual worlds. You're looking at a slide of Claudia Hart's installation of her exhibition, The Ruins at Bitforms Gallery. And this exhibition was also translated into um, a replica in Mozilla Hubs, where um, people could experience a, a replica of the actual exhibition online. The artist would do tours with uh, visitors. And then other models would be creating exhibitions from the start in virtual worlds. So this is an exhibition curated by Julie Walsh in Mozilla Hubs for Median the Munich. And um, this also was a, a large scale in world show in which um, projects were kind of translated into the space in multiple ways. And yet another model would be virtual reality. So here a brief glimpse of the MODA, the Digital Museum of Digital Art, uh, which happens entirely in virtual worlds with pavilions in which artists' works reside. And I'm very happy to curate the MODA 4.0, which hopefully will launch next year. So just a few words on collecting the works commissioned for Artboard were five years ago all brought into co the collection of the Whitney Museum. You can read more about this um, in this great article that Marisa Olsen wrote for Rhizome. And for now three years, I have my own uh, acquisition committee for digital art at the Whitney Museum. And for the programmed exhibition specifically, we were able to bring a lot of works into the collection, among them early computer drawings by Manfred Moore or Chuck Churi's Sign Curve Man, uh, works by Joan Truckenbrode, you see them here in the installation again, and landmark pieces such as Lynn Hirschman Leeson's Lorna. Um, Natalia pointed to all of the collections uh, complexities of bringing this work into collections. And I'm just going to show you two pages of a 10 page questionnaire that every artist whose work enters the Whitney Museum has to fill out from the classification and content, general uh, information, production history, through all of the details of the code and all of the elements of the work, which is the first step of preservation. And um, to close off a few words about preserving, I think we now have at cultural institutions really established uh, standards for preserving through storage or migration or emulation or recreation. 
and institutions are closely working together, but each work is different and poses different challenges. So a few years ago, the Whitney uh, undertook an initiative to restore Douglas Davis work of NetArt, the world's first collaborative sentence, which was launched in 1994. And we made a unique decision to create two versions of this work, a live version where you can continue to uh, add to this ongoing sentence, but we left um, links, for example, broken. And then we also made a restored historic version available. And in this version, if you encounter this page, for example, and you click on White House, you will be brought to the Wayback Machine and you can launch all of the whitehouse.gov pages over time. So uh, I want to close by saying just a few words about the uh, Whitney Museum's Media Preservation Initiative. Again, a lot to say about it, but just to give you an idea of what the Whitney has been um, doing. So MPI, the Media Preservation Initiative, creates kind of a centralized platform that um, consists of a resource um, space and Archive Medica, a digital preservation system that automates conservation tasks and creates viewing files. And this is accompanied by in-depth information on all of the works. For a, a few years, uh, MPI and Artport have been working with classes at NYU in computer science and the Institute of Fine Art to do code analysis of many of the works in Artport. So um, you see here a list of the works that we have been addressing. Here just a shot of an analysis that students recently did um, of a work by Barbara Lastanzi, C-SPAN times four. And uh, here's just an idea of the annotation of the code that we've been doing. So I'm going to end it here, just a brief overview of all of the different activities and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian, for this informative presentation. Our second speaker is Lev Manovich. He's a presidential professor at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, and he's director of the Cultural Analytics Lab, author and editor of 15 books, including Cultural Analytics, Theory and so of Software and Culture. His book, The Language of New Media, is translated into 14 languages and used as textbook in hundreds of programs around the world. He was included in the list, list of 25 people shaping the future of design in 2013 and in the list of 50 most interesting people building the future in 2014. His digital art project was shown in over 100 group and solar exhibitions worldwide. Lev, how did you get into the field and why do you stay? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your research interest. Lev, please. Hi, uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be part of this panel. So as both Natalia and uh, Christian pointed out, uh, the people started to ask questions about how to collect, preserve, archive and exhibit digital art approximately around 97. Uh, but I think for many young collectors and uh, museum people, it's a very new thing. So I will try to address these questions from kind of perspective of my very recent current research. Um, and I'll talk about two things. One is very And listen very briefly, the idea of um, kind of simulating art using artificial intelligence and how this new stage in the development of let's say digital art, digital culture, perhaps may lead to revaluation of in fact changing values of historical art and recent art. So let me share the screen. Okay. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. 
so um, in Italy, you know, a few weeks ago, the MIT Press has published my most recent book, Cultural Analytics. Uh, it's based on research I've been going on doing for about 15 years. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is actually show you the kind of table of content for a book. Here it is. And uh, you know, we're not going to talk about the whole book in the next five minutes, but I want to just very briefly introduce the idea of chapter five. Um, and the chapter is called Cultural Sampling. So here's the idea. I, mean, I talk about this in the context of a kind of slightly different you know, paradigm, which is now we have kind of big data. Uh, how can we study kind of history of culture and contemporary global culture right? using looking at millions of artworks, you know, millions of photographs on Instagram, millions of digital artworks, millions of paintings from 19th century and so on. But I think the same issues are quite related to uh, collecting, archiving, like what to collect, how to collect, and how to represent the culture of our time. So uh, the idea of sampling, right, comes of course from statistics in social sciences, right? So in humanities, uh, we select based on or based on this idea of masterpieces, right? We have to collect things which are most important because they are best realizations of uh, humanity. But of course, whatever is best realizations often turn out to be dialogical. So for example, since the 1970s, uh, our historians started to be gradually aware that most of works in museum are by men. Right, so now we're trying to compensate for this and trying to bring bring back into collections, you know, important women painters, women artists, and so on and so forth, right? But the result is, while it's very important, the result is that you take one canon, you take some people out, and you put other people. So you're still selecting, right, a very, very small, really tiny fraction. So think about any kind of book, any survey book of 20th century history or 19th century On, for millions of artists who are working in the 20th century. What do these people have, what do these people do? You know, uh, if you put all these people next to, you know, the small number of people who made it into the canon, would this lead to some revelations, re-evaluation, re right? Of originality of people who we think are the greatest. Maybe it turns out where our artists who were actually more interesting, more important, but we didn't have powerful friends. You know, we didn't have, uh, you know, Rochenko in Russia or, you know, or Andre Breton in France, you know, they... Uh, because what our museum subtextbooks contain and our private collections contain is a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage, except maybe a few occasions, and without understanding what all these other people who we don't put in the collections in the museums have, have done, you know, we don't really innovative or not innovative people are. So the idea of sampling, as I said, comes from statistics and social sciences, and statistics develops in the 18th century is a way to study phenomena systematically. And uh, as a part of development of statistics, which then becomes as calculus, a kind of major instrument of all sciences, including social sciences. In the last 15 years, it becomes a major instrument of humanities because you know, the key development in humanities the last 15 years have been digital humanities, is that you kind of create a method to decide what do you include. Right, and uh, I found it to be very
right? Can be a population of atoms, can be a population of stars, right? And you do it by systematically looking at like a much smaller sample, right? So this idea of representative sample, uh, and this representative sample allows you to think about larger population. So what does it mean to collect a representative My scrap is periodically disappears. Yes. So, um, so how would you go around, right? Asking this question, what would it mean to collect a representative sample of art of our time, or to exhibit a representative sample, let's say, of digital artists from 1960s or painters from 1860s, right? And going back to history. So typically, what we do in a museum is we put what we think are best people. Why not put also mediocre people to have a kind of contrast, right? Um, why not, uh, so for example, or that's one way, right? In our way is to say, let's say we figure out some procedure and we know that in the you know, 1870, uh, there has been, let's say, you know, 20,000 or 10,000 pages in France. So we can use some kind of statistical and systematic procedure to sample these painters. And then the question becomes, will we even see impressionists, right? We'll even see these 13 people who are participating in impressionist exhibitions, or will we only see like maybe some realists, but mostly the salon painters, right? So that's another interesting thing. I think why uh, it's important to ask this question because by collecting only the avant garde, large history people who did something new, I think we don't really have a good sense. Or, or what was the typical thing which audiences saw at the time uh, and you know, how, how, how visible the avant-garde artists were. So I just want to show you one image just to illustrate this. Just a second. Okay, here we go. I hope my things didn't close yet. Uh, okay, just a moment. Sorry, my computer seems to restart itself. Okay, here we go. Okay, yeah, here we go. Okay, so it's just one thing I will show you very briefly. So um, in 2010, I did this exercise. It's been known that uh, French Impressionist artists have painted about 13,000 uh, oil paintings and pastel in a very kind of time, right? So this is basically about 13 artists who participated, I think, in seven Impressionist exhibitions in the 1870s, 1880s. But normally in all the art books, you may be You see the same things over and over. So we said, what if we try to collect virtually, right? As many paintings and, and pastels as, as we can. So together with students in my classes, we try to go online, right? And collect everything we could. So we couldn't collect all 13,000 because our close up the space and here you see uh, a kind of paintings that we normally associate with impressionism yeah? the kind of light the shadows are very colorful often the images uh, of outside scenes right so it's a new modernity kind of Paris uh, some portraits right that's what we think impressionism is so that's one view, right? On history of art, you select what you think is important, best, innovative, and so on. 
But if you look at everything, you realize that what we think of the Impressionism is maybe only about 30% or less of what people painted, right? So we also painted much more traditional paintings, right? Always dark paintings, always kind of brown paintings. Maybe we painted when we were students, maybe we painted when we were later, right? That's already a separate question. And to me, that's equally interesting, right? An equally valid way of looking at art suggested to us, right, by big data, uh, by the balance of data we have in a digital sphere, right? So, uh, so to you know, digital collecting, it's not only about collecting digital art, which is very important, it's thinking about history of art and uh, understanding kind of, right, the role of so-called masterpieces versus everything else in a new digital way, right? Uh, so that's just one example. So I hope that this very, very short introduction to the idea of cultural sampling was a bit interesting. Uh, if you want to see more, <laughs> Uh, you can find this in my book, and I hope you're publishing uh, kind of more research in this area and um, thinking also very practically, perhaps, you know, creating some guidelines. What would it mean to create a representative cultural sample of any culture, any time, including, let's say, the digital art of our time? Thank you so much. Lev, st Lev thank you so much for your insightful presentation. And I hope we'll have time for the discussion. And our third speaker is Anne Spelter. She's a digital mixed artist and academic pioneer who founded Digital Fine Art Program in Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design in 1990s. And she is an author of Computer in Visual Arts in 1998. Spalter works are in permanent collection of Victoria and Albert Museum, Albrecht Noch Art Gallery, Rhode Island School of Design, and others. She is known for, for her large scale public projects, including in 2016, MTA installation, The New York Dreaming. The Anne and Michael Spalter Digital Art Collection is one of the world's largest private collections of early computer art comprising of over 500 works from the second half of the 20th century. And how did you get interested in the digital uh, art field? And why do you stay? What was the inspiration behind the Anne and Michael Spalter collection? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your creative process and your art collection. Anne, please. Thanks so much. Thank you, Natalia. And um, it's an honor to be on this panel with so many luminaries in the field. I'm going to screen share. My presentation. Um, as Natalia mentioned, I have uh, with Michael Spalter this large collection of early computer art. And it came about because I was working on this textbook, The Computer and the Visual Arts, which I started to write when I was developing the curriculum for digital art courses at Brown University and the Rhode Island School of Design. And I didn't really find the materials that I needed to teach with. So I began putting together my own, which eventually became this book. And it was quite a long process. So I was working full time and writing the book and it took about five years. So pretty much everyone who knew me had to become interested in early computer art and the um, concepts and history behind it because it was all I talked about or thought about at that time. And Michael Spalter, who was an art history major at Brown said, um, you know, at first I wasn't overwhelmed by these pieces, but they've really grown on me. And this is like every movement that I've ever studied in art history. It's like the Impressionists, the Academy hates them, but they all know each other. They've been working for decades, making this beautiful work. And um, we should really help them on their path and try to acquire works if we can. And we were lucky that at the time they were pretty inexpensive. Um, and we began collecting work, not with the idea of making a large collection, although it's turned out to have, I think there's now almost 800 pieces online, um, but just as we could getting pieces. And actually the first work that we acquired, we had to choose between getting a sofa and getting an artwork and went with the artwork. So just to show some examples of things that are in the collection, this is one of the earliest pieces by Ben Leposky, and it's actually an, an analog piece made with an oscilloscope and photographed off the screen. And similarly, this work is sort of a combination of analog and digital. Um, Desmond Paul Henry repurposed bomb sighting machines and made these beautiful drawings and 
I think it's also a nice example of taking technology that was industrial or corporate or military and using it to make artwork. Frida Naki has been in this field forever and created some of the most beautiful works, I think. And this one in particular, I like, it's very early and it's a plotter print, but with the um, ink pen, he managed to get a very hand done feeling to the piece and beautiful colors. Manfred Moore, who um, Christiane showed as well, has also been a, a pioneer working on exploring different representations of the cube in 2D space, 3D space, 4D space and beyond. And he actually began doing this earlier than Saul Lewitt with his explorations of the cube. So I think he's really an important artist who was overlooked for a while because he was using the computer, um, which there was enormous hostility to in its early days and still some of that remains, but we're proud to have a bunch of his works in the collection. And also Roman Verotsko, who was a monk until he met his wife who was a nun and they both left the orders but you can see some of the influence of that illuminated manuscript, medieval look in his work, which is really beautiful and plotter based. And then he puts on this gold leaf or silver leaf by hand. And Jean-Pierre Hébert, who began working in the eighties, but I think is one of the pioneers of the field um, is known for using equations from physics and making these very beautiful sensual pieces which are really in contrast to a lot of the geometric work that dominates in the beginning of this field. So you may not be familiar with the names of those people if you're not interested in computer art and early digital art, but we have some works also by very well-known artist Damien Hirst and here David Hockney, who has explored technology from Polaroids to fax machines and now the computer and just blends it right in with his practice. And it's really a, a role model for me and he created this bizarre sense of space in this very large work. And um, one of the stars of the collection, I think, and also an inspiration to me personally is Vera Molnar, who's now 96. She began working with the computer in the 60s and it was very hard to get access at that time. She actually, um, during the student riots, went into her husband's business because no one was there to use the computer and her prints or um, they say Job Molnar at the bottom, but it was actually her husband's name because she was using his account. And she started from the very beginning. Here's her work in um, the Thinking Machines show at MoMA. And they actually recently acquired a work of hers as well for their permanent collection. Um, and throughout all of her work, she's worked with these systems and sometimes she's just done it by hand, like this piece with gouache. So um, she goes back pretty really seamlessly back and forth between so hand done systems and the computer. Um, so that's the collection and some of the work that's inspired me as an artist. In my work, I was trained at the Rhode Island School of Design, just traditional painting and drawing and have started using the computer obviously, but basically the content has been the same the whole time with kind of a set of personal images and icons that have private meaning for me, but also I think universal application and a lot of them overlap with Jungian symbols. Um, one of the challenges I think for digital artists, which may make things hard for museums, but is um, to get things off of the screen and away from the reference to television. So one attempt to do that that I worked on is these video gems where we started by just pouring resin onto a screen, but ended up with a two part acrylic mold with a um, injection molded piece in the back. I know it's not have video. Oh, it does have video. There you can see it going, fireworks video. Um, and video prints where the center is a screen put behind the print. And you can see a larger version of that here. So this is five feet wide. And what's nice about that also, is that you can have it on for a long time without growing tired of seeing it. So when I have works on the TV in my living room, after an hour, I have to turn them off. But with that video print form factor, they can be on all the time. And then recently I've been working on these small um, sort of sandwiches of acrylic, which you might recognize from the infinite objects pieces. And I don't know if you can see through my chroma key, but have one here as well. And that was a lot less expensive than making the video gems and has a um, really nice production value.
in the interest of time, I won't show all of them, but these spheres emerge. And um, another approach is an immersive one, being responsive to the spaces in which um, there was a call for art, or in this case, the spring break art show in 2016. And this is all wallpaper based on footage shot from a helicopter over in New York and Brooklyn. And these are enormous inflated spheres that were at Pulse that same year. And they were filled with helium, which was really a challenge. We had um, an entire truck full of 200 pound containers of helium that we had to roll around and use to inflate these. And the um, largest ones could even take you up in the air. And there was an augmented reality app that went with that and just um, something I hope we'll discuss and that Christian um, I'm sure has thoughts on. I actually recently sold a work that had some AR in it just as a bonus, but it was through a third party and through various misunderstandings, the client thought the AR was a permanent part of the work that would always be supported. Meanwhile, the app that I used doesn't exist anymore. And I received a panicked call saying, how can we make the AR work and had to redo it completely um, and break the news to her that it wasn't going to be technical support for the rest of time in this work. But I think a difficult situation because there's so much great AR work being produced, but hard to maintain it. And in this piece, um, which Natalia mentioned, is a site-specific installation for the Fulton Transportation Hub in New York City downtown. And it was really fun because they have 52 screens in there of all different sizes, including some that are really huge. And in this one, um, I actually ended up drawing it by hand because it was a projection piece, but it was an atrium with a lot of glass and the projection just didn't work. So part of what I do is go back and forth between the digital and the analog. I won't show that loud sound, but a very large projection in Hong Kong Harbor. And this piece, which you see on my background was in um, Brooklyn at Kent Avenue. We're using some of those spheres to create a tropical environment that people could come and sit down, plug in their laptop and work in. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go quickly over these to say I've been working with artificial intelligence and creating work that combines different things together to make new compositions that are interesting to me. Often the resolution is low, so I ended up painting a bunch of them that were in a show, or in this case, starting with a low res AI thing that I then made into a pastel drawing, um, worked with someone on a 3D model and created a giant inflatable and there are AI videos in the background. And then most recently, and something I hope we'll discuss later, are um, NFTs and crypto art, which provide a way for digital artists to reach, I think, new audiences and have works um, be sold and exchanged very transparently in a way that's quite different from the traditional art world. This is just an example of how this was made. So these are some of the issues that I think come up with crypto art and I won't go over all of them now because maybe there'll be some time to discuss them later on. Thanks so much, and, this is all my info, thanks. And thank you so much for this informative presentation. And our fourth present is Anna Franz. She is internationally renowned new media artist. She is curator who co-founded the Silent Media Art Lab and St. Petersburg Art Project, and Silent, uh, Silent Media Art Lab is one of the most active nonprofits, and also it's prominent for its archive of Eastern European video art online. Anna Franz has contributed to symposiums and panels for universities, festivals, and exhibitions worldwide. Franz also participated in an exclusive 17-day expedition to Arctic Circle with the Farm Foundation of Arts and Science. And in addition, Franz family collection in it contains numerous new media artworks in addition to paintings and works on paper. Anna, what was the inspiration behind Silent Media Art Lab? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your creative process and your, your research interests. Anna? Uh, thank you for having me on uh, this panel. Um, uh, uh, silent and eventually SciFest, uh, which appears to be the largest art tech festival in Eastern Europe now, uh, comes from my uh, 
all art practice. First, I'm an artist, then all other things. <laughs> Um, I got classical education at Stiglitz Academy of Art in St. Petersburg in 1989, I graduated with a deg degree in industrial design. At that time, it was Soviet Union still, so it was no need for high design there. However, during my studies, um, I was introduced not only to traditional media, such as painting, sculpture, and so on, uh, but uh, all kinds of making using variety of technical methods that eventually led through art methodology to using technology as a material in my art pieces. Let me share the screen and I'll show you a couple of uh, things. Where do I share the screen? Ah, share the screen, okay. Here we go. Uh, this piece is called Artist Union. Um, uh, and it was inspired by um, seeing the museum. I don't remember what museum it was, but um, uh, it was um, four still lives uh, made by prominent uh, artists of the beginning of the uh, previous century. Uh, and the, it was uh, same still life, but taken from different angles. So pretty much how students paint, but think they were uh, known artists by now. And uh, uh, I, I was paying attention that um, 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 opposed to computers uh, who doesn't have the point of mistake, human point of mistake, they're all different and well-known styles. So, um, uh, we made those robots, yeah, and uh, how they built actually those are robots, you can give them uh, any drawing tool, like pencil, pen, whatever, and then make them draw, sorry, that's different, yeah, yeah, uh, make them draw whatever you show them through the camera. Uh, you've seen the pictures like they were drawing the still life, this, or the environment, and the next step, I haven't done it yet, but the next step will be uh, to make the, uh, those pieces into watercolors by human hand. Right. <laughs> okay, this is one piece. Another one, this, this one is called uh, Pack of Salt. Um, uh, work comes from saying that sounds exactly the same in English and Russian. In English, uh, it's uh, a man must eat a pack of salt with his friend before he knows him. Uh, in Russian, uh, it will be чтобы узнать человека надо с ним пуд соли съесть. So this is basically consists of the uh, uh, white screen, so it's called, and behind the screen, this is a, a salt container that the releases a fine salt, and eventually there's a big pile of salt. The the, the installation has to be loaded with salt uh, uh, every day. Um, Okay, stop sure. Uh, during the years, we, um, over the years, we did a number of projects in silent uh, with close collaboration between artists and engineers. And I would like to show a short video demonstration of that.
had theme ID happened in um, four cities uh, based in St. Petersburg, then Moscow, Venice, and New York, and more than 100 artists participated. Uh, upcoming SciFest, um, uh, which, is, which theme is uh, Cosmos and Chaos, we had to move to mid-November mid because of the COVID situation. Um, uh, but I hope it will happen. And in February, the special Leonardo issue uh, with the Cosmos and Chaos theme is coming out, bilingual uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, now we'll start our discussion. And I would like to start with the Christian. Uh, Christian, you mentioned that in 2013, the Whitney Museum undertook the conservation initiative to restore Douglas Davis' work. The, the, the world's first collaborative sentence. And the conservation team made an unprecedented decision to duplicate the work and present it in both the original and the updated forms. As the curator of digital art at the Whitney Museum, can you please tell us what were the main challenges for Davis Project and Artport in general? And how have the archival and preservation method evolved in the past five years? And what do you predict will, will happen in the next five to 10 years? Uh, Christian, please. Thanks so much. I will briefly uh, share my screen again as a refresher, starting with the Douglas Davis project. So this work was created and launched in 1994. And the main challenges for the conservation of this work were ultimately philosophical because it is a piece created in HTML. It's not that difficult to restore. The biggest challenge for us was that um, while Douglas Davis was still alive when we started this work, he uh, was not available to talk to us anymore. And the main philosophical question we faced, in addition to some technical things that went wrong and could easily be fixed, was, well, this piece is um, by now 20 years old. 
and there are lots of broken links in there. And do we leave them broken? Do we say this is the nature of the web and its environment? Or do we say, well, but there's the Internet Archive and a lot of these lost pages have been archived. And that ultimately really led this decision to create um, the live version where links are broken and then the historical version where you can go back in the Wayback Machine. And it's really only digital art that um, offers that possibility to create different versions and make them um, accessible. So that was one unique challenge. Um, talking about challenges for Artboard in general, many of the more than 100 pieces that I curated and commissioned over the years are not functional anymore. Part of it is due to Java, for example, not being browser supported anymore. We're in a continuous process of basically porting pieces from Java to JavaScript. And now Flash is going to be phased out. And once again, here go at least 20, 30 of the works. So there's an ongoing challenge and we um, have been addressing it through MPI in particular documentation really is so crucial to this hence as a first step all of the code analyses and um, annotations that we have been doing so the challenges in the immediate future will really be addressing um, softwares and plugins uh, phasing out or being phased out by corporations. The scenario that Anne um, mentioned also was really interesting here uh, with AR. But what I have high hopes um, for in the future is cloud-based emulation. Uh, Rhizome um, has already worked on um, emulation on a larger scale. And my hope is that in the not too distant future, Amazon and other providers um, will allow for cloud emulation on a larger scale so that you could really run all of these older pieces in their native browser uh, environment again. So those would be just some basic ideas on that front. Uh, thank you, Christian. And thank you for restoring such a historical work by Douglas Davis. Uh, personally, I do remember warm uh, visits uh, uh, to Douglas Davis Studios back in the 90s and a lot, this was my introduction to the digital art wall and his uh, Worcester uh, uh, studio space and was like a gathering yeah. for many, many people back in the late 90s. Anna, uh, Silent Media Art Lab since, 2000, since 2007 is a major driving force dedicated to expanding the intersection of art and tech. And one of the important parts is made in silent video collect, I mean, made in silent collection, consisting of works by permanent members of silent uh, and as well as the guest artist. How do you ensure that the primary sources, the artist's intentions and ideas are recorded and carried out in the future? And what are your thoughts on general guidelines for art institutions in terms of technical documentation for digital artworks? Uh, Anna? Uh, this is a very important question for us. Uh, we have been working for a while on the question of archiving of our installation sound and video. Uh, we actually, uh, to this day, we prepared a special um, archiving form that Silent recommends, which we are going to publish on our site after our talk. Using technology as a tool frequently leads to different type, uh, types of art, artwork reality that are not possible to convey solely through text specification. Uh, we took our chief engineer suggestion uh, to have an interview, since we're dealing with living artists, to have an interview with an artist. Uh, uh, archivation of technology-based work requ requires additional data for construction. I personally find it very helpful to have video interview with artists. To my own surprise, and I know every work we did by heart, after listening to my colleague uh, interviews, I discovered many new aspects of the artwork. Thank you, Anna. And Christian, you mentioned that Whitney Museum created guidelines for the artists to follow. 
And what are your thoughts on creating a general guidelines for all the museums and art institutions in, in terms of technical documentation for displaying digital art? What is the role of the curator in guiding and educating the artists through the preservation process? And what are your, few, what are your views on ideal collaboration between the curator and an artist on the preservation process? And how to document the environment to allow the future viewers to better understand the work itself? Uh, Christian? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, all great questions. So I would like to start with the guidelines. I think it would be really helpful if museums um, would streamline a little bit more. We are all working together anyway, but right to your question, I so often get emails um, by other institutions, curators asking, oh, could you share your artist questionnaire with us? You know? I think it would be really helpful if um, all museums would have a general questionnaire for uh, digital artists that you then can modify according to your own needs. I mean, we, we also wouldn't want to have a cookie cutter template, but I think it would be enormously helpful if consortia would work on making general guidelines available. The display um, and guidelines for display are really tricky issue for digital art because more than any other art form, it is really mutable. Very often works do not get installed the same way from one uh, institution event to the next. You, so you may encounter them in radically different form, always depending on space, on budget. And what we need here is really a lot of focus on exhibition history and how to document that history to be able to uh, adequately tell the story of um, a work. So we are working closely with all of the artists. Um, Anna mentioned interviews, which are standard. You know, um, that's one of the first steps, the questionnaire or the artist um, interview. Some are, to some artists, these um, frames for thought of uh, thoughts about preservation are fairly new. Uh, many others are really well versed in thinking this through and can also um, make a lot of suggestions to the institutions themselves. But it is always a um, close process of collaboration between um, a curator and an artist. And I think all of the results of that also provide a really helpful template for private collectors and how to go um, about ensuring the preservation of the work. Thank you so much, Christian. Now we jump into the completely new media. And you mentioned that you recently have been working on crypto art. So what issues crypto space and NFT, P NFT introduces to the archiving and preservation methods? What is the biggest challenge in the moment? And what effect has NFT made on art market and art collecting? I am. Um, all awesome questions. I think right now the whole um, crypto art space is a little bit like um, the early computer artwork was. It's kind of separate from the traditional art world. And a lot of the things that are um, selling for enormous amounts of money probably wouldn't even be considered um, fine art by a lot of the art world. So it's a very interesting, but um, I think very positive community that opens up art making and art buying to a lot of people who would never go into a gallery in Chelsea and ask for a price list. So I think there's enormous, enormous potential there. And it also makes transparent things that are very difficult to find out now, or you have to pay money or know someone to know what an artwork sold for and who owns it. Um, all those things are completely um, available and visible to everyone on the blockchain. But some of the downsides, I actually bought a crypto art piece um, a few years ago, just when I was experimenting with the field and I lost the password to my Ethereum wallet and that piece is gone. I mean, I'll never get it back. So you're unlikely to just misplace a painting in your home and, and never see it again. So there are some strange things about the digital and uh, blockchain based art world that I think need to be addressed like a way to maybe recover passwords if you lose them. 
um, someone could also steal your password and your cryptocurrency and your artwork, which um, is different than having someone, you know, break into your home and take a painting. So there, I think there are a lot of an interesting issues, but I have really enjoyed being sort of a part of the NFT community. And uh, it has just a very positive vibe to it, I think. Thank you, Anne. And uh, Christian, uh, now we're thinking about like the works which are which are based on like social media and cultural analytics, which uh, Lev is involved. And uh, what do you think are the main challenging for this type of projects? And uh, what are your thoughts on software hiding and upgrading? And um, uh, you know that providing context is the, one of the important missions for the museums. And uh, what are your thoughts, how we can keep the social media process and how they transform the function of art and shape contemporary culture and how may privacy concerns and tracking influence our preservation and documenting context for these particular works? I think Antistian. it's a, yeah. Um, thank you so much. I think that's a twofold question, yeah, uh, which on the one hand concerns artwork that is created on social media, but then also the kind of information that museums and cultural institutions make available on social media and uh, provide context for. What makes the space difficult, of course, is that it is corporately owned. You know, once you sign that user agreement, you're also signing away content, et cetera. So we have seen in recent years uh, many more projects and performances that happen on social media platforms. And of course, here we're facing how do you archive that work? How do you document that work? Uh, Rhizome, an organization based uh, in New York, have done very, very groundbreaking work in helping with the creation of the web recorder platform, which allows us to create dynamic um, archives of Instagram performances, for example, or Facebook performances. There was a work by Amalia Alman, for example, Excellences and Perfections, which got a lot of attention. But uh, Amalia continued to use that um, account on which the artwork had been created. So now tools such as Web Recorder actually allow us to um, create snapshots. But this is a very difficult um, territory for which guidelines still need to be established for cultural institutions. We have to be prepared um, for losing a lot of content unless we carefully archive once a platform is bought, goes um, out. So these are all, I think, um, new challenges for the future that we will have to address. Uh, thank you, Christian. And now we're going to, uh, to um, discover some um, questions regarding the public space. And uh, in 2016, the MTA Arts and Design commissioned you a 52 screen digital art installation, which you mentioned, New York Dreaming, to be installed at the Fulton Center at Subway Station in New York City. What were the main challenges, technical and archival consideration for creating the work to display in a public space? Uh, Anne? Uh, yep, thank you. i not exactly answering that, but just to... Um... I almost didn't get that project because I got an email and the subject header was great opportunity for you. And I was, had my finger on the delete button because I thought it was some kind of spam. But then I saw there was a 212 phone number in there. So I thought, I'll just call it and see if there's anything to this. So I was lucky to get the project because I almost um, deleted myself out of it. But uh, actually they had just put in a new video system. It's um, run by the Westfield Mall. So it was a, it's a fantastic system. It's all run, um, can be controlled by an app on the phone. So the technical support was wonderful. The biggest challenge was probably remaking all the video to fit the different resolutions of the different screens and to think um, artistically and aesthetically about how a video would work on those central screens that are just really long bands. So that was fun because usually all videos are, you know, 1080 by 1920, there's these very standard aspect ratios. So it was really fun to do things in a different aspect ratio and see what other things could be communicated that way. 
but when I got in there to test it, they could put everything up on the different screens right from their phone. And I think that is the future of um, a lot of artwork that will be shown in public spaces, that buildings now are actually constructed with screens in the lobby and very sophisticated AV systems behind them and they're looking for artwork. So I think that's an interesting place for video artists to show work in, in public and uh, institutional spaces on the screens that are now there. Uh, thank you, Anne. And Anna, uh, many of your works are interactive and transformed depending on exhibition space. Uh, what are your main challenges, uh, both visual, technical and archival consideration for creating and redisplaying the works like Union of Artists, which you showed earlier? And what are, you of you, what are your views on ideal collaboration between an artist and the curator on redisplaying an installation process? Uh, Anna? Um, as an artist, um, I work in series, uh, so meaning that project uh, starts as an idea translated by necessary technical means in, into module first, and then space becomes the part of the project. So the space is the, the part of the installation. For instance, uh, artist union were shown uh, into three very different places. Uh, it was shown at Stiglitz Academy that uh, looks like basically Italian palazzo with a large hall in small, in tiny St. Petersburg, oldest St. Petersburg gallery, uh, Barre, which is just small white rooms, and also in National Arts Club uh, in New York, which is kind of has Victorian appeal. Uh, as for um, ideal co collaboration between artist and curator, uh, first this comes to mind uh, that uh, when I'm thinking as curator would be a uh, detailed description of the project uh, from artist text, specs, interviews, and etc. It's really important. As an artist, I'm re really terrible at it, <laughs> but um, wearing several hats, uh, uh, I have a suggestion uh, to all artists that please do your homework. Otherwise, when you are gone, the person who will be recreating your work will put his or hers own uh, thoughts into your project. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anna. And now we have very interesting uh, uh, question from the audience. If the works are meant and cannot be preserved, how do we capture the moment. Uh, well, or... <laughs> I'll, I'll start it. Uh, ultimately, I think any artwork could be preserved and digital art, while it is subjected to this ever increasing cycle of obsolescence of technical evolution, uh, a lot of it is also code based and code based art is more stable than a painting, for example. If you still have um, that, that documentation of the code and annotated code, there's a good chance you can revive it. Uh, it's um, easier to revive such as um, paint. I think largely this is still a problem of taking on responsibility and of money. The art is not collected enough. There aren't enough institutions that take on the responsibility of preserving the work and that cuts to the core of the question, what do we do then? And I think what we need to do is really crowdsource as much as possible documentation of these types um, of works, uh, how they have been installed, what the artist's intent was. And uh, we really all have to work together. I think a great model is gaming culture to the best of my knowledge, no computer game has been lost, largely to an army of fans and 13 year olds who sit in their bedrooms and recode things. And if we can get that same kind of momentum going for digital art, we'd be in much better shape. Thank you so much, Christian. And one final can question. I, can the I digital... the opposite? Oh, yes, please, Anne. Yeah, please. Uh, can another, you please uh, elaborate on this, uh, on this question? Of this another um, and perspective. Project? that one can have as well. And I was thinking of the Buddhist monks who make those beautiful sand works or they're amazing visual works made of sand and then they just sweep it up at the end and it's gone. And maybe not all artwork is meant to last forever. So it's sort of a materialistic approach when you're a collector because obviously you want it to last forever. But I think it's okay for some artworks not to last forever. That doesn't have to be a requirement of an artwork. 
And I have to, this is a super interesting conversation that often happens. So I have, I add one more to that. I would not take issue with Anne's statement per se, but I'm also an educator. And having people do the same works all over again, because they cannot experience the history of it anymore, you know, um, to me is um, so important. You know? And I, it's always the artists, I think, saying, well, you know, there is an ephemeral aspect to it. And then the educator and curator um, is coming back saying, no, 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 I want a record of your work for eternity. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's the balance when we were starting our conversation, the balance between the data and the appearance and the artistic and the artistic uh, intentions. And well, now the, the final... Uh, uh, with the exception, if uh, uh, not to last forever is a part of the artwork in this case. So the, the, I, I think uh, it's a good point. And now one of the final questions, um, uh, probably we'll start with Christian. The digital media today is extremely hybrid. And what are your thoughts on new formats for the exhibition? You mentioned quite a few. How do archiving issues influence your selection and curatorial, curatorial process? And what are the main challenges in the installation process? I absolutely agree that um, installing, displaying digital art has become so much more complicated with the hybridization of formats. You know, you may have an installation with an AR app and a web component, and you're juggling all of these different um, aspects. From a curatorial perspective, and I think I can speak for most of my colleagues here, we do not... Um, prioritize you know, our concerns about archiving. We believe in the work, we want to show it, even if the archiving of it and all of the challenges outlined will make our lives hell, you know? We, I think we will still agree to go there and um, put it out there. But what we need is really uh, more solid foundations for being able to do the um, archiving and preservation and documentation of these extremely hybrid uh, works that we're seeing right now. One thing that I would like to see a little bit more in the future, and I think that's something that has been brought about by the challenges of COVID, is a better integration of um, online representation of artworks and exhibitions, which I think can become much more part of the work itself, rather than being straightforward representation of a work, I think they can play into it in new and interesting ways of display. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Anna Oyen, would you like to uh, add a few words uh, to the new exhibition uh, formats? Um, I'm looking forward to have the uh, SciFest as a physical event. <laughs> to tell you the truth. I think we're all looking forward to actually to, to experience exhibitions in person and hopefully it will come soon. I thank you so much, Anna Franz, Christian Paul, Lev Manovich, and Anne Spalter for sharing your thoughts, perspective on art and curatorial practices. Your passion for the digital art form bring us a step closer to recognition it of, as, of it as a major global movement to historicize the key development and to embrace new waves into the 21st century. Thank you audience. Thank you silent media. Thank you silent media art, Ground Salianke Gallery and the Kaladiat Foundation teams and Leonardo Journal and the community for fostering and guiding dialogue on art and technology. Let's continue the conversation. Follow Laser Leonardo Art and Science Evening Rendezvous Talk St. Petersburg on social media. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.